Is tying humanitarian assistance to human rights the right course for Afghanistan? Aid agencies this week imploring the West, and in particular the U.S. Treasury, to allow money transfers to flow unhindered and to unblock desperately needed funds. And when we say desperate, it is winter. And the United Nations estimates that more than half the population doesn't have enough to eat there. With famine and shuttered healthcare facilities come disease and a spike in uh, epidemics like pneumonia. Are the Taliban fit to govern? Those who fled or are hiding argue not. But then again, what happened during the two decades where they were out of power? Afghanistan's grown, but also seems to have grown more dependent on outside assistance. With uh, revenue nosediving now, the country's left with its addiction to remittances Coming and the drug this. trade. How to change the course and whose job is it to fix it? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the famine in Afghanistan. Joining us uh, from Washington, Obaidullah Bahir, lecturer in transitional justice at the American University of Kabul. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. He's a former Afghanistan country manager for the World Bank. William Byrd is senior analyst at the United States Institute for Peace. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. From Geneva, Matt Reed, Global Director of Institutional Partnerships for the Aga Khan Foundation. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. Last December, uh, France 24 reported on a displaced persons camp on the outskirts of Kabul, where women were forced to sell their children to survive in Cadiz. In West, Western Afghanistan, Sky News this week, speaking with desperate families, also forced to sell their kids. Okay. Um, that desperate uh, situation that you saw there uh, in Cadiz, uh, Obaidullah Bahir, uh, what right now, and since the last time we spoke, which was at the end of last year, uh, what's changed? I think things have uh, gone towards uh, being worse. Um, Look, it, it was obvious from the get-go that aid wasn't going to solve the problem. When you're choking the economy of Afghanistan with sanctions, when you're refusing to allow any sort of capital injection through the Federal Reserve being unfrozen, the situation is just going to keep getting worse and worse. And no sort of aid would solve it because if the goal is to create parallel structures to the current uh, de facto government in Afghanistan with regards to the service industry and so on and so forth, uh, it hasn't worked elsewhere in the world. It didn't work last time the Taliban were in power. And this is a unique opportunity to try and create something more sustainable within Afghanistan. And of course, that doesn't mean accepting the Taliban at face value right now. There's much that needs to be discussed, but there better ways to go about it. The discussion shouldn't be between recognition and non-recognition and backbreaking sanctions. There's a huge range of options in between that we need to discuss. Okay, so it's not binary, and we're going to get to that because that is the heart of the matter there. Now, let's just remind our viewers, though, last month, former UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who's now the World Health Organization Ambassador for Global Health Financing, he launched an appeal for a pledging conference to raise $4.5 billion for Afghanistan. But as the UN Secretary General recently pleaded, there's no point in raising money if world powers won't let the cash in. We need to suspend the rules and conditions that constrict not only Afghanistan's economy, but our life-saving operations. At this moment of maximum need, these rules must be seriously reviewed. International funding must be allowed to pay the salaries of public sector workers. From surgeons and nurses to teachers, sanitation workers and electricians, all are vital to keeping systems up and running, and they are critical to Afghanistan's future. We need to give them a reason to stay in the country. Now, in an editorial this week, the Financial Times pointing to uh, $1.2 billion worth of support that's been frozen by the uh, World Bank. Uh, the bank and its key sponsors, writes the newspaper, including the U.S., the European Union and the U.K., have equivocated. It has promised to look at the matter at a board meeting later this month. Delays are no longer 
tolerable. Uh, William Byrd, uh, your, your thoughts on that? Well, just to be clear, it's been uh, something like 14 years since I left the World Bank, so I certainly am just speaking in my personal capacity and not on the behalf of the World Bank. Uh, there is movement toward getting that $1.2 billion uh, remaining from the trust fund uh, put to use. And uh, it's taking longer than it should, but I think that's in the works. And uh, as the previous uh, guest said, it's it's not aid alone that will uh, will solve the problem. So, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a dire situation, as you said, when you started the, this uh, segment. And uh, really, it needs an all hands on deck response from all sides. Uh, and stabilizing the Afghan economy at some point will be really important, even if saving lives right now is, is the top immediate priority. So, Matt Reed, just after the fall of Kabul in August, we already were having this discussion. We knew this would come to this. And yet uh, there still are those uh, U.S. Treasury restrictions. They've been eased a little bit so that humanitarian assistance can get in. But everyone's always wary when that happens because we've seen in other parts of the world how uh, whether or not the rules have been loosened or not is confusing for uh, outside players that don't want to run afoul uh, of uh, the United States on these matters. I think that's absolutely right. You know, we've been saying uh, from the very beginning that we needed some clear statements uh, around relaxation of the sanctions or at least clear statements about exemptions. I think to its great credit, actually, the U.S. Treasury came out quite quickly uh, and had a very uh, a broad interpretation of humanitarian exemptions and also meeting basic human needs. It's taken several months to get the UN uh, to do that, but they did it in December. Uh, the UK and the EU incorporated those into their laws, domestic laws, last week. Uh, and then the, 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 the Treasury has just um, you know, made some recent, uh, I think, clarifications, making it very clear to banks that they can transfer funds. And I think that's critical because one of the real challenges is that banks, of course, they look at the sanctions regimes. They have to weigh up the commercial risks of getting involved in a place. There's no commercial interest for them to be involved in Afghanistan right now. And so when they're weighing that versus the possibility of, say, freezing all their dollar transactions, if they happened somehow uh, to violate that sanctions regime, it's very hard for a bank to make a decision to take that risk. And so I think the U.S. Treasury clarifications last week, we now have the other exemptions in place, and it's really now up to banks to say, we have a role to play in this situation, and we cannot do that work without them. It's a crucial first step. A crucial, um, you know, a crucial a, first a, step, a, and and, and our Matt, organization is. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say a crucial first step, and just to make it clear for our viewers, the U.S. dollar is effectively the world's currency, and 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 you know the the, the United States has a huge reach around the globe because so many transactions on this planet happen in dollars, and particularly in a place like Afghanistan. Exactly. That's exactly it. And so, you know, if you're and most banks have uh, also, you know, they're, they, they have dollar interest, they have clients who want to bank in dollars. So if for whatever reason they're blocked out of that system, commercially they can't function. And so the risks are, are we have to be frank, they're very big for banks. But I think what's very helpful is that now what's clear from the Treasury uh, 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 clarifications last week is that there are no risks. They've said very clearly that commercial banks can facilitate those transactions and also that in or, that in doing that they can work with afghan state financial institutions and state uh, private financial institutions and that's also very important because banks were quite worried that well if they transfer the money in uh, you know what does it mean that the money would go say through the afghan central bank at one point and would there somehow be a kind of infection and and uh, uh, let's call it uh, uh, collusion in some way with the Taliban. The new clarifications make it very, very clear that they are allowed to do that to deliver critical humanitarian aid. So uh, let's, uh, uh, Baidullah Bahir, you're in Washington right now. If you want to uh, wire money back home to loved ones, how does it work? Um, look, I'm already leading a food initiative in which we're trying to provide bread for 200 families a day within the province and city of Kabul. 
Um, so that means they get coupons, they walk to their relevant bakeries and they get uh, 10 pieces of freshly baked bread every day. Um, and just moving the money is a complete headache. There is uh, so many loopholes to jump across. I tell people that very often when we are getting $3,000 into Afghanistan, by the time it reaches Afghanistan, it's barely $2,600. And that's a crazy amount of overhead that has to be spent. How, on do, how does that work exactly? So basically, uh, the easiest way would be to transfer money through the Hawala system, which is you give money there and a business pays you within Afghanistan. But that itself is a very gray industry uh, that a lot of people don't want to participate in. Then the solution is to move the money through Western Union or any other uh, service to a neighboring country to Afghanistan. And you already m lose a lot of money in the exchange rates there. And then you have to pick that money up and either physically move it into Afghanistan um, or do a Hawala again. Uh, but at the end of the day, like I said, you're losing 20, 25 percent of the money you're trying to bring in. And just to, be, just to be clear, the, the easing of the restrictions by the U.S. Treasury, as described there by Matt, have they changed anything? Um, I think what it has done is help enable uh, organizations, aid organizations from the U.S. to be able to provide aid and, and not have as many obstacles. But at the end of the day, unless there is cash inside Afghanistan, you can't really move money to Afghanistan. So if you wire money through any service that's Western Union or MoneyGram, at the end of the day, you can't even receive that cash So because they don't have that cash. And then they send it to your bank account and then bank accounts have restrictions of a specific limit every week. So if you're trying to send in thousands of dollars, that's not the mechanism you're going to use. The mechanism you're going to use. So a slight easing, but still very complicated. And then there's the question of what happens at the other end. For the second time in three months, the country director for the UN Development Program has called out Afghanistan's central bank for blocking money needed for programs and salaries of local staff. The uh, UNDP uh, has uh, some $30 million stuck at the uh, central bank, at AIB, rather, a bank uh, that I cannot convert to Afghanis without, uh, which is the local currency, Without uh, uh, Afghanis, as you can imagine, we cannot implement all our programs, uh, says uh, that uh, UNDP chief Abdallah al-Dardari, who back in November told Reuters of uh, Afghanistan's cash crunch, $4 billion worth of uh, Afghanis in the economy, but only $500 million worth in circulation. Uh, not enough bills, not enough coins. The Afghan Central Bank responding to his latest complaint with, what well, a blanket denial uh, saying uh, that uh, the uh, Bank of Afghanistan has sufficient Afghani cash reserves and has responded positively to every demand in this regard. And there are no concerns noticed in regard to the Afghani liquidity so far in the 34 provinces of uh, this uh, country. Uh, Brilliant Bird, your reaction to that uh, tiff between uh, that very important United Nations agency and the central bank in Afghanistan? Well, one of the, I'm not sure, I think it may be making a mountain out of a molehill. I think there is a shortage of Afghani currency, but since this represents the cash U.S. dollars that were shipped in at high cost by uh, Money Corps uh, on behalf of U.N. agencies, there's no reason why those cash dollars can't be withdrawn from the banks in the form of dollars and used for payments. Now, there is a slight problem for some very small payments because uh, Obviously, the, the U.S. cash is in, in high denomination bills, so that could be an issue for small payments. But if you're, others would know better than I do, but if you're paying a, an Afghan household of, say, seven, eight, ten or more people $100 for a month of, of subsistence and income support, I think that might be well in line. So uh, I don't see the problem. If the Taliban are not allowing dollars to be withdrawn from dollar-denominated accounts, that is on them and is a very counterproductive policy, which uh, urgently needs to be changed. Well, at this uh, point, I think it's more an issue of the smaller denominations rather than an issue of liquidity. Now, quickly on the bank, Afghani banknotes, this is something that the government of France really could get involved in because, as far as I understand, it's a French company with a printing press in, in Poland, and they're... Uh, uh, concerned and scared rightly about the sanctions. And if they got reassurances from the 
French government, uh, they might be more willing to print more Afghanis and also, of course, getting reassurances from the U.S., which I believe has already been in contact with the company. Gosh, so, that, that, let me just let me just get Matt Reed's reaction on this, because, I mean, just to make it clear again for our viewers, we're talking about a, a, a nation's banknotes that have to be printed outside of the country. And in this particular case, they hesitate as to whether or not to send them to Afghanistan. Well, sure. I mean, there are some some I think some some people have raised questions about if you were to say flood the economy with banknotes, you might it might lead to inflation, et cetera. I think the key thing to understand is what uh, the the UNDP representative said in his statements to Reuters and others. You know, you've got four billion Afghani that are out there, only five hundred million in circulation. It's not enough, and so uh, we do need efforts to try to bring some of that liquidity into circulation. I think the really important thing, though, is to actually make some of these macro changes, both through sanctions, get some banks making transfers to the country, regularize some of the international transactions that existed and that are perfectly okay now under the sanctions regimes so that you can build some confidence in the banking system. The real problem is that people are not depositing the banknotes that they have into the system because, uh, as our other panelists talked about, there are currency uh, controls. You can't withdraw uh, money from banks. So you have a couple of things that could be done inside the country to build a bit of confidence in the banking system and then allow the, the economy to function a little bit more normally. Now, I should say, I, you know, the, the, one of the other things uh, as to we, what, what William was saying, we've, you know, for essentially four months, our organization, the Aga Khan Development Network, which is one of, uh, you know, uh, next to the UN largest develop, set of development agencies in the country with 10,000 employees, we could not transfer any money into the country, virtually none. That means that our staff have not been properly paid in four months, et cetera. Just last week, we were able to open a banking channel through Crown Agents Bank in the UK, which to his great credit has understood that there is a wide lane under the current sanctions exemptions. So we're now getting money into the country. We think about two thirds of our payments can be made uh, bank to bank. So you don't actually have to withdraw them. So just even making some of those wire transfers and those bank to bank transactions could get something back to a little bit more normality. And, and, and on that, and on that point, again, and, as I said and, earlier, these are critical first steps. And on the point that was raised at the outset by Abdullah uh, uh, here uh, about how you whether or not you can set up, quote unquote, parallel structures, that is to say, try and isolate the Taliban as much as mm. possible but at the same time, bring money in. I know it's it's something that the international community is grappling with when it comes to uh, uh, Myanmar and trying to bypass the junta there. With Afghanistan, is it possible? I well, which was the question, Derek? Well, I, I I'm sure. I'll put it. I'll put it to Matt Reed first. It's absolutely possible to work in Afghanistan in a way where aid money doesn't have to go through the state. We've already seen it in something called the Sahet Mandi program, which is essentially where the government, uh, the previous government of Afghanistan had outsourced, if you will, the provision of health care in many of the provinces. Uh, our network does that, where basically we run the health program on behalf of the government. We pay salaries through that. We purchase things through that. The, the, it, is, it is perfectly possible for that money to go directly through organizations like ours and then on to uh, pay doctors, nurses, et cetera. There are ways to do that even around the, the education system. UNICEF is looking into it. Uh, and it, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely possible and plausible. Uh, Obedullah Bahir? Yeah, so a few things that I want to highlight. There is a discussion going on and gaining traction with regards to the recognition of the Taliban. Uh, if you look at a few statements from the UK and so on and so forth, um, I think recognition itself is a very strong leverage the international community has, which shouldn't be wasted. Um, I think it sets a very bad precedent if the international community is willing to recognize the Taliban at the current face value and after overthrowing a democratically elected regime. That being said, I don't think the solution is non-engagement or working around the Taliban. And I say that for a few reasons, because A, if you notice the discussion that we just had about the money and, and moving it in, it's a very 
typical example of how aid isn't the solution unless there is actual cash within the economy and something there is some sort of movement uh, nothing can come out of it but it's really problematic when you refuse to engage and try to build another aid model i mean the failure of the previous republic was its crazy amounts of aid dependency one and number two there's very often going to be gaps that are missed by the international community that the government de facto government can address and lastly there's always going to be overlap for example if you've seen the latest usip report it says that the taliban are generating national revenue Revenue, but what are they spending it on and what then should the aid money be spent on with regards to the services being provided by the government so for all of that discussion to happen i mean yes don't give the money a blank check to the taliban and expect them to do right by it but there are ways of trying to use this as an opportunity of teaching the taliban how to govern whilst keeping strict monitoring bodies in place to make sure that the money isn't abused and the, the, that power doesn't go to waste. So there are ways to go about it. It's just that we have to be creative because this is a very new problem. A very new problem. So very how do you engage without uh, uh, full recognition? We're joined by Afghan journalist Aman Farong, former reporter for One TV News. Thanks for being with us here in the studios in Paris. You. Um, you, do you agree with what you just heard from uh, Abaidullah that uh, no engagement with the Taliban is not the solution either. So, yeah, we think in, uh, there is no time for recognizing of uh, Taliban government. This is not a government. This is a, a, a terrorist group that they are in Afghanistan. There are more than 35 million Afghans are suffering from Taliban. So they, they're killing the people, they're killing the women. So they're killing the journalists. There is nothing in Afghanistan. Just Taliban come by help of the uh, Ashraf Ghani in Afghanistan and uh, U.S. Uh, support the Taliban by uh, agreement in Doha. But this is make the Taliban to come by uh, military. But then there's the reality on the ground right now. Which so, yeah, is this people, is the reality. But the reality on the ground is people are hungry. Yes. And they need food. So but, how yeah. do you go about it? So, yeah, Taliban abusing from this situation. Taliban don't think about the, the situation of Afghan people. There are more than 93% uh, of the, the people of Afghanistan are a lower uh, uh, poverty line in Afghanistan. And more than 90% of uh, health clinic in Afghanistan is closed because of a lack of uh, uh, fan and uh, medical. So what did you do? Did you bring in the international community again? Yeah. The Afghan people uh, need to uh, help by international communities, but it's important how they can help. You know, the UN sent money in Afghanistan, but it still is in an international bank, but they can uh, uh, spend that and can help that. But they sent a lot of uh, help in Afghanistan, but Taliban uh, uh, gave the, this uh, money and this uh, food for the, their religion. The, the people that support the Taliban in, in north of Afghanistan, in central of Afghanistan, in Badakhshan, Daikundi, in Bamiyan, those, the, those people are very, very in bad situation, but the Taliban then give them money or then give them uh, medicine, they don't give them uh, the, anything. But the, paper, the Taliban ask the, all the people that they are support the Taliban and their uh, military. Let me bring in William Byrd. Do you, uh, what do you do then? Is it possible, again, the, the, this concept uh, that you've, uh, we were talking about, about parallel structures, is it possible to have parallel structures or do you have to deal with the Taliban? I think there's a need for uh, some engagement with the Taliban. I absolutely agree that it uh, would be very premature to engage in recognition. Even Pakistan, which supported the uh, Taliban for nearly 30 years by now and was their sponsor for over these many years, has not yet recognized the Taliban, which shows, uh, I think, shows something. So I, I, I think recognition is not something I look at as uh, as as one of the options. Uh, but there is a need for engagement uh, in the USIP paper that the other panel has kindly referred to, which I wrote. Uh, the Taliban have a budget which includes teacher salaries, yet internationals are all over the place uh, talking about paying teacher salaries. So well, that needs to be sorted out, right? You don't want double payments. You don't want, if the international community pays for the teacher salaries, then the Taliban budget resources are freed up uh, to use for other purposes, such as justice, security, prisons, or something like that. So, so uh, the general point is you need an, enough engagement, and, and the World Bank would be the obvious candidate to engage non-financially with, uh, with the government so that there's a better understanding of both the central bank, the banking system issues, 
and the uh, Taliban resources. They raised some 400 million in taxes in the last quarter. Final point, I, I would really like to stress that this has to be seen as a risk management issue. The idea that somehow food aid, physical food aid, which is the most humanitarian of all humanitarian aid, is not being uh, diverted or misused or in some way benefiting the Taliban is wrong. So, so the idea that somehow you can insulate everything from the Taliban is, is, is simply way off. And you need to weigh different options which carry different, risk, uh, different risks and different benefits. For example, maybe it's quite possible that some forms of mobile own uh, accounts and liquidity in that way would actually be less vulnerable to diversion by the Taliban than the physical food aid. I'm just giving that as an example, but uh, I've all along stressed the need for a risk management approach versus a zero tolerance approach, which is completely unrealistic when it, you're talking about $4 it, billion. It's an aid. important example because, and I'll put it to Matt Reed, again, I come back to the example of Myanmar where uh, tra money transfers with mobile phones are proving an important source for those who want to bypass the system in that standoff there with the junta. Uh, is that a, a viable way? Is that something the Aga Khan Foundation looks at? Absolutely. I mean, um, the, our network actually owns one of the largest telecoms uh, uh, companies in the country called Roshan Telecommunications. It introduced uh, something called M-Pesa, which is based on the M-Pesa uh, mobile money transfer system that was originally piloted in Kenya. Afghanistan, in our program, was the second country in the world to introduce it. It's been uh, in, in, in existence since 2008. That's a platform that's being used now. One of the challenges right now is linked to liquidity. So, you know, part of the challenge is that you might be able to transfer things mobile to mobile, but then how do you cash out? And so in really remote areas, they do need, uh, you know, they, they do need access to that. But, you know, there's a way actually to deal with that. I mean, we could, for example, uh, using uh, development assistance and, and humanitarian aid, you can increase the number of cash points. You can increase the number of cash agents. You can help facilitate access um, to mobile accounts and to these M-Pesa accounts. It's absolutely something that we can and should be looking at uh, in Afghanistan to help facilitate some of this aid. All right. And w of course, there is, at a time when the economy has uh, grounded to uh, much of a halt, one source of income that remains opium. Uh, we can show you images uh, filmed this past week by Italian television La Rai in the Maiwan district of southern Kandahar province. Uh, you want to stop the opium trade? Give us an alternative. That was effectively the message uh, given uh, by Taliban authorities when Sonia Ghazali and Shezep Walla visited the Pul i Sokta neighborhood of Kabul for France 24. At nightfall, these Taliban fighters turned policemen are on a hunt. They are looking for drug addicts who roam the streets of the capital city. At least 4 million people, or nearly 10% of the country's population, is addicted to drugs. We are saving them from drugs and guiding them back to the right path to give them a good life in society because it is our responsibility as a new government. Tonight, in front of our cameras, they don't find any. By the grace of God, we've cleaned up this area by arresting all the drug dealers. You were with us on this patrol. Did you see one addict? There are none. Since they took power, the Taliban claim to have immensely improved the security situation in the cities. However, a violent operation by another patrol aims to chase the drug addicts away. A civilian present at the scene filmed it on a smartphone. The violent eviction methods do not prevent the addicts from coming back the next morning. This vacant land in western Kabul is one of the headquarters of the drug dealers. According to these drug addicts, violence against them has escalated since the arrival of the Taliban. The Taliban often come here with sticks to hit us 
to scare us every time we run away. But sometimes they shoot us with their Kalashnikovs. These men live in inhuman conditions in the middle of the sewage. A number of drug addicts die here every month and are buried in the mud. When we find them, their face is covered in bees, even in their nose. The last man who died, we covered his face with a cloth to chase them away. But despite that, the bees continued to stick to his face. We had to bury him quickly. The drug abuse is nothing new in Afghanistan, and none of the previous government has succeeded in stopping it. In the previous Taliban regime from 1996 to 2001, the fundamentalist group had almost eliminated the production of opium. Yeah. But now, Afghanistan represents 85% of the world's production. Today, the Taliban are more ambiguous. The Ministry of Promotion of Virtue and Repression of Vice has published a strict code of conduct. The hard down machine to collect a charge, Tariak, Porter of the Sinur Almotadin, Chipsargan Dolis, Timali Manak. But the Taliban leadership makes clear that they would only put an end to the production of opium under certain conditions. Last year, our leaders issued an order that the Taliban are not allowed to interfere in their affairs. If the international community recognizes us, we will ban the planting of these substances as the way it was before 2001. When they do not end up in beatings, the raids carried out by the Taliban also lead to imprisonments, or more rarely to forced rehabilitation, as in this rehab center where places are already scarce. <laughs> Following the recent Taliban takeover, Washington froze the reserves of the Afghan Central Bank, an amount close to $10 billion. Since development aid is blocked, the center has been financially strangled. If we don't get any support from the international community, everything will come to a stop. This is almost already the case. Our activities have been reduced by 70 percent. If the money does not come in, this center will automatically close. According to the UN, in the coming months, 97 percent of Afghans could fall below the poverty line. Faced with international isolation and an economic collapse, it is unlikely that the Taliban will be able to follow through on its promise of drug eradication. Abdullah Bahiria, your reaction when you heard uh, that uh, representative from the, the Ministry of Virtue say, if the international community recognizes us, uh, we will stop the poppy growing. I mean, many promises have been made before. Um, and going back to the point of recognition, I mean, the Taliban need to stop seeking it from the international community and need to find some sort of internal legitimacy first, unless the Afghans people people's will can be reflected uh, in who leads the country. Uh, I doubt the international community would be too interested in recognition. With regards to the opium and drug trade, uh, the Taliban unfortunately were a fundamental part of its um, existence. Uh, the fact that they relied heavily on the drug trade, almost $0.6 billion of their annual fighting budget used to come out of it. Uh, means that they will have a difficult time dealing with the industry now. Um, and some of it is their fault. Other, The other problem is what is then the alternative? And there are alternatives out there. And we did previously discuss ideas such as hemp uh, being grown within Afghanistan because of how fertile the land is for it and how many different products can come out of it. So we are trying to work on projects with regards to hemp and producing hemp flour and seeing if we can um, make that a more national uh, 
uh, thing, create a market for it, and hoping that the Taliban have a sense of not just banning opium, but actually introducing an alternative for it for the citizens, because the NATO tried and they failed in the past 20 years to find an alternative or anything sustainable to ban uh, the narcotic. But let's hope that there are good alternatives that can be presented to the Taliban and they can have a sense of going through with it. William Burt, for two decades, uh, this, this discussion has been happening. What's the alternative? How do you develop the alternative? Why has it not happened? As you said, this has been going on for two decades, uh, minus the one year the Taliban had a remarkably effective opium planting ban. And that was politically probably the worst mistake that the 1990s Taliban regime made because it very much undermined their, their support in certain areas and then uh, facilitated or, or at least, uh, yeah, facilitated or eased the uh, remarkably surprisingly easy victory over the Taliban in 2001. So, uh, so questions about whether that's politically a smart move, but more important in the current situation when you've lost the equivalent of 40% of GDP in uh, aid, do you also want to uh, to attack the most, uh, you know, one of the most uh, biggest employment provider in rural areas of Afghanistan? I think the answer is no, this should be off the table in the short run. Of course, in the long run, you need development, you need alternatives. Uh, you need neighboring countries to get involved. The, the opium goes somewhere, right? It goes through Pakistan, through the northern borders, and through Iran. So uh, there needs to be a more unified approach. But simply trying to get out of it when for 20 years the international community could not do so, even during a time when there was plenty of aid going into the country and also economic growth generally was pretty good, uh, it's really unrealistic to think about uh, taking major measures in the current situation. And I suspect the Taliban will be smart enough not to do much on that. They really lost out because they, they did impose an effective ban in the year 2000. They were still not recognized by the UN and they didn't get any other benefits from it. And in fact, it weakened them uh, in advance of the 2001 uh, inter international intervention after 9-11. And, and since 2001, Aman Farang, we've seen, and we talked about it earlier during this discussion, this increase in international aid. And now with the international community gone, we realize it was, uh, to quote uh, Obedullo speaking earlier, an over-dependence on that international aid. How do you get Afghanistan back on its feet without being over-dependent on uh, international aid in the future? So unfortunately, in two decades, uh, all the international community, all the uh, countries that came to Afghanistan that we fight against terrorism. But unfortunately, all the international community, all the countries that come to Afghanistan, they leave Afghanistan, Afghan people alone. Now it's very difficult that we say, to say that, yeah, come help uh, Afghan people. So you now Taliban come by the help of U.S. and ex-government. You know that U.S. had uh, a very long negotiation in Doha with Taliban, and they accept the Taliban as a government. You know that in uh, 2000, uh, uh, and in February of uh, 2020, they had an agreement, and Taliban came by that uh, agreement in Afghanistan. Now, we cannot say that to, why the, uh, the U.S. Uh, cannot come to Afghanistan, but you, if the international community wants to come to Afghanistan, if they want to help Afghan people, it's easy. They have the uh, need to uh, force on Taliban. It's very clear message from Afghan people that the Taliban is not acceptable for any uh, for Afghan people. Now the Afghan people want to that yeah come to help and, Afghan. And people. are the Taliban of 2022 the same as the Taliban that were forced out in 2001 or if they changed? Now on that time I at now Taliban is very very I think that it's not changed it's changed that killing for people. Now on that and now the people cannot go to the school the girl cannot go to a school the woman cannot go outside and there is nothing and just Taliban come from one nation in Afghanistan there is there is not majority and a minority of people. There is many group of people that they are not in government. Just Taliban come, and there is uh, about uh, 30,000 of uh, people. They just now in Afghanistan that 
more than 30 million people they don't accept the Taliban. Right, they're ruling, but they're, but they're not governing is what you're, what you're saying. Uh, nonetheless, speaking to the BBC, the former head of uh, British NATO forces in Afghanistan says it's time to face reality, quote, I think the West is going to end up recognizing the Taliban government. If that's the case, we'd better get on with it quicker, sooner rather than later. There's a great phrase to be magnanimous in victory. I think this is an occasion for us to be magnanimous in defeat. Uh, Matt Reed, is that just where history is going right now? Well, I mean, we're we're a, a neutral, apolitical organization that are there for the people of Afghanistan. That's why we've been in the country for over two decades. We started when the Taliban was last in power, uh, and we've remained ever since. So it's not really for me to 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 pronounce on whether or not they should be recognized or not. They are the authorities that are there. In order to work for the people of Afghanistan, you have to work with them and you have to coordinate them. So in that sense, we do have to accept that reality if we want to stop enormous human suffering. I, I, I do want to say that, I mean, I, I think it's, it's inaccurate to say, for example, that no girls are going to school in Afghanistan and that uh, there are no, there's no opportunities uh, still on the ground in Afghanistan. It is a very different situation across the country. Um, there are, you might even say there are, you know, so, so, so that the way that, you know, things that are happening in Kandahar are very different than the way they're happening in Faizabad or, you know, up in Kunduz or Takar or, or Badakhshan. And so I, I think it, it's really important to understand that there's a lot of room for local variation and local negotiation and engagement. I mean, one of the things that we do is we work with local communities who articulate their concerns and they go to the new authorities, just like they went to the previous government, uh, or they went to, to call it the, the shadow authorities uh, previously. And those communities themselves say, these are things that are important to us. We want our girls in school. We want, uh, you know, uh, roads, irrigation, etc. And they're able to uh, negotiate for themselves. I think it's important as an international community that we support them in doing that because there is space for it. Uh, space for it. That'll be the final word for now. I want to thank you so much, Matt Reed, for joining us from Geneva. I want to thank uh, William Byrd and Obaidullah Bahir in Washington. Aman Farang, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.